Hi Church, I hope everybody is doing well. Um, as we get started this evening, I gotta tell you, I can't wait till we can be back together in person because, uh, well, first of all, I just miss interacting with you in a face-to-face -face kind of a situation rather than taping here in my, my home. I think it won't be long before we'll be able to be back together again. And from a logistical point of view, I think um, every time I tape, with one of these tapes, it drives me crazy because in order to see, I mean, I'm old, right? So I have trifocal. focal. So in order to read my stuff, I have to tilt my head back like that. And when I do, it creates glare on my glasses. And so it's just, if I, if I hold my head down where there's no glare, I can't read. You know, old man glasses, sorry. Uh, but this won't last forever. This is going to be going back to regular meetings soon. Anyways, enough of that. Let's get on with our study. Welcome to Connecting the Dots, where we are looking at the Old Testament and seeing how that connects to the New Testament and how that relates to our lives today. We've been in a pattern of looking at the nation of Israel. We looked at the prophecy of Daniel, where he prophesied uh, 70 weeks, which uh, we went through all of that, seeing, well, how does that relate to us and to the time of Jesus and so on. Uh, today we're going to look at another prophecy that relates to Israel, and it, it, it's in regards to the Middle East. You know, the Middle East is a cauldron of activity, and uh, there's a lot of prophetic significance to what happens over there, even in our day. And so, as we connect the dots, I want to dive into a passage in the book of Ezekiel, which is an obscure book of the Bible, but so important to us. Ezekiel chapter 38 beginning in verse 1, this is what it says. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Togarma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Now these verses talk about an alliance of nations that is formed and using ancient names, that this, this coalition of nations are going to come together and they're going to come against Israel. And the very first name that he mentions is Gog. And Gog is described really in two ways, as being from the land of Gog, and then as being the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Well, many Bible scholars believe that Gog is, is not specifically a name, but it's really more like a title. Like we would say Pharaoh, or Tsar, or Caesar, or Herod. Those were all titles that were given to a group of people. So Gog is a dictator who is going to hatch an evil plan. In Ezekiel 38.10 it says, Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day, that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan. So I want to look more closely at this idea that Gog is from the land of Magog. You know, Flavius Josephus, a first century historian, wrote in his famous book, The Antiquity of the Jews, that, quote, the people of Magog are the people whom the Greeks called Scythians. Well, that's a crucial clue to us because we know from history that the Scythians were a people group that migrated from the Middle East northward, settled north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in the region we know today as Russia, the former Soviet Republic. And also, Ezekiel 38, 15 says, uh, says that Gog will, quote, come from your place out of the remote parts of the north. And in Ezekiel 39, 2, it says that Gog will come, quote, from the remotest parts of the north. Well, the country that's farthest to the north in relation to Israel. Remember, all these prophecies are always in relation to Israel. They're Israel-centric. So if you're standing in Israel and you think, what's the country farthest to the north? That country is Russia. That means, if we take this literally, that a Russian dictator will build a coalition of forces to surround and attack Israel in the end of days. 
And that raises a huge question, you know, that people have today. They want to know, is Putin, who is now the leader of Russia and working to get into office for many more years, even though there's term limits in that country, he's devising a plan to get rid of term limits. Is Putin Gog? And that's a question a lot of people are asking. Joel Rosenberg, a commentator, author, a uh, man who resides in Israel says that he was asked this very question recently by lawmakers while speaking on Capitol Hill, and this is his answer. He said, Putin is certainly Gog-esque, but it is too early to speculate on whether he is actually the biblical figure that will arise to power in Russia in the last days and build an alliance to attack the state of Israel from, quote, the north. That said, it is fair to say that geopolitical events over the past decade, and certainly over the past year or so, have been moving on a trajectory consistent with the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will see the prophecies come to complete fulfillment in our lifetime or soon, but we cannot rule out the possibility. So there are some possibilities there as we watch what's happening with Putin, with Russia, with the Middle East. There's all kinds of involvement right now with Russia and the Middle East and Syria and Iran, and, and everyone's focusing on Israel. So it's enough to get our attention as to what's going on. Um, in uh, there's, there's a grouping of nations that are listed in this prophecy. Uh, Rosh is listed. Many scholars believe that refers to Russia. Meshach, um, some scholars say refers to Moscow. Uh, others say it refers to Turkey. So there's a little bit of a, of a disagreement between scholars, but one of those two nations. Tubal is a region known as Tubalusk in Russia along the Tobol River. And then Persia, which is easy to identify because the official name of, I, uh, of Persia uh, was, even in our modern age, it didn't change to Iran until 1935. So Persia is Iran and was called Persia right up until 1935. Kush is the upper Nile region that, that we now know as Sudan. And while the current state of Ethiopia may also be involved in the war, the focus is really Sudan, which today, of course, is a radical Islamic Sunni state closely allied with Iran and Russia and deeply anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Put, according to Josephus, uh, is ancient Libyos, a uh, territory that we would know today as Libya or Algeria. Uh, interestingly, both countries today are deeply hostile to Israel and closely allied with Russia. Gomer is what we now today would call Turkey. And, uh, you know, for much of the past 80 years, it didn't make sense that Turkey would turn against Israel because Turkey was a NATO ally was a friend of Israel, the U.S., and the European Union, but in the last few years, the Turkish government has swung dramatically away from the West towards Russia and Iran, though Russia and Turkey are having some conflicts right now. Uh, but Erdogan, who is the leader of Turkey, wants to become the leader of a new caliphate. He wants to become the leader of the Islamic world. And so Turkey is more and more becoming hostile towards Israel. And then Beth Togarma is mentioned. And this is the Turkic-speaking peoples that spread out from Turkey across the Caucasus and across Central Asia. And, and we can't be uh, certain precisely which modern nation states from this area will join the anti-Israel alliance because uh, these are almost all Muslim countries with close links to Russia and Iran. It's amazing today, though, as we watch the alliance being formed between these key players. It's like it's all being set up. All the chess pieces are getting into place these thousands of years later after Ezekiel made this prophecy. Uh, and the chief uh, driving force of this whole coalition of nations is Russia. You know, and, and what would align, what, what would, why would Israel align itself, why would Russia align itself against Israel? I mean, what is in it for Russia? Um, they're not an Islamic state, although there's a growing Islamic population in Russia. Uh, but the other nations that are gathered together, the one thing they all have in mind, in common, is that they're Islamic and they have a hatred for Israel. So why would Russia join with them? Well, several reasons have been suggested. Uh, Russia's desire for regional supremacy, it's clear that Putin has been working in Syria and with Iran and in those places to try to be seen as the leader of that part of the world. Russia's need to maintain a, a counterbalance of power against the West. 
um, because we've had a lot of influence in that part of the world, still do with Israel, although our president has pulled us out of Syria, so the pieces are always moving and shifting. Uh, and then Russia's reassertion of its might after its humiliation in the early 1990s. Uh, it's trying to grow back its reputation as a world leader, as a dominant force. Now the prophecy that Ezekiel gave says specifically that these coalition of nations will attack Israel. In Ezekiel 38, 7, it says, Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be summoned. In the latter years, this is about the end of times now, in the latter years you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. But its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. So, this is saying that there's going to come a day when the people of Israel are going to be gathered from all over the world and they're going to be gathered back to the mountains of Israel and living securely in that land. I mean, that was fulfilled in 48, 1948, right through to the present day as there's massive migration into the land of Israel. It's growing, becoming a dominant power in that part of the world. And so this coalition of nations, according to Ezekiel, in those latter days are going to amass an attack against the nation of Israel. So it's all prophesying things that are going to happen in Ezekiel's future and in our future as well. Uh, now, one of the motives for this invasion is wealth and power. In Ezekiel 38, 12, it says to capture spoil and to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations, who have acquired cattle and goods to live at the center of the world. I love that. Israel is the center of the world, and these people have gathered from all over the world, and they have now acquired cattle and uh, goods. And I mean, Israel is the chief exporter of, of produce to Europe. Israel is prosperous. Uh, in fact, in Genesis 49, there's a fascinating prophecy uh, that Moses wrote in verse 2 and then again in verse 40, uh, verse 25, it says this. Gather, this is Genesis 49.2 and 49.25. It says, Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father, from the God of your father who helps you, and by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. So in the last days, the Bible says that Israel will receive a blessing from the deep, of the deep that lies beneath the land of Israel. Well, what lies beneath the land of Israel? Well, uh, in recent years, it was discovered that there are trillions, trillions of metric tons of natural gas under Israel's soil. And Israel has been able to mine that gas and they've gotten to the place where they were uh, energy independent and even shipping uh, resources to other nations and have been incredibly prosperous uh, because of the natural gas reserves that they have found in that land, bigger than just about any other in the world. And so a massive, massive wealth is available in this tiny little piece of land like, it's like the size of Rhode Island. It's not very large, and yet there's incredible reserves that are there. Now, this, so these nations under Russia's leadership are going to come against the nation of Israel. And when they do, God is going to bring judgment on Magog and Magog's forces. This will be one of those moments when there will be a supernatural, uh, God will supernaturally punch into this world. You know, so much of what God does supernaturally now is kind of be behind the scenes through the prayers of his people. But this is going to be one of those out in the open miracles. And then this will be one of those events that triggers, again, another age of miracles like we see in the Bible. Ezekiel 38, 19 says, And in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown thrown down, the steep pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground, and I shall call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against 
his brother, and with pestilence and with blood I shall enter into judgment with him, and I will reign on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. This is like a Sodom and Gomorrah judgment that's going to come down on those forces. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how it's going to happen, but it does declare it's going to be supernatural judgment. Uh, you know, and, and so this is not a war started by the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, these are not missiles from the Israeli Air Force. Uh, there's no evidence in the text of the Israelis even defending themselves. But the God of Israel steps in and defends Israel himself, raining fire and brimstone down on enemy forces and utterly destroying them. You know, so why does the Lord act this way? Well, the Lord tells us directly in Ezekiel 38, verse 23, he says, And I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. So God is going to reveal himself in a way that he's going to become obvious. And Ezekiel uses ancient language to describe modern warfare and what's going to happen in this war. Uh, for example, in Ezekiel 39.3, he says, I shall strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. Now, bow literally means launchers, and arrows literally means missiles. So the coalition of forces that are coming against Israel are using their military might, and God is going to destroy their means of being able to attack the land of Israel. Uh, and there's going to be some kind of nuclear exchange. So God's going to rain down fire and brimstone. Uh, the nations around Israel are going to uh, attack, maybe trying to use nuclear weapons. I know Iran is, is uh, just bent on producing a nuclear warheads. And uh, so uh, that very well could lead to some kind of nuclear exchange. It could be that God responds with his judgment and then they respond back. There seems to indicate some kind of war, because if you look at Ezekiel 39, 14, and again, some of this is a little bit of guesswork, but Ezekiel 39, 14 says, And they will set apart men who will consistently pass through the land, burying those who are passing through, even those left on the surface of the ground, in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. So they're hiring professionals to cleanse the land after this exchange is over. And they have to wait seven months before cleansing, which, you know, sounds like it could be something like radiation. Ezekiel 39.15 says, And as those who pass through the land pass through, and anyone sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the buyers, barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamongog. So they're not allowed to touch the dead, but they have to mark it for others to take care of. And notice it's bones. It's not the flesh. The flesh is gone. Um... You know, and the bones are to be buried east of Israel, downwind. You know, so I don't know, perhaps this is a reaction to radioactive uh, bodies, radioactive waste. Zechariah 14.12 says, Now this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will will rot in their mouth. It's like the people are going to be dissolved in a moment while they're still standing on their feet, which sounds like some kind of nuclear exchange. Um, many people believe that this war that is prophesied uh, is going to start the prophetic clock ticking, that this exchange will plunge the world truly into chaos. This is going to be World War III with an Islamic invasion of Israel it's going to plunge the world into chaos. This may lead up to the rapture. This may be the thing that sparks that. There, we don't really know if the rapture is going to come before this or after this. We don't know the timing of that. Um, this will certainly um, be before the Great Tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, but it's going to plunge the world into chaos. And the thing is, you know, we've been so preoccupied with the coronavirus that we've not paid much attention to what's been happening in the Middle East. And I think if you review what's been going on, it's like this virus came and put a hold on everything, but if you review what's been going on, it's significant. Let me just take you through a really quick timeline, just so we get this in our minds of some of the chess pieces that are moving over there. During his 2016 presidential campaign, Donald Trump repeatedly blasted the Iran nuclear deal. Remember that, that President Barack Obama 
made that uh, a key foreign policy achievement, and Trump said he was it was a bad deal and he was going to do away with it. So that was his declaration, and indeed he did when he became president. In May 2018, two years later, as the president, he announced he would be formally pulling the U.S. out of the deal, which granted Iran sanctions, relief, and returning frozen assets to Iran in exchange for restrictions on its nuclear program and international inspections. And since then, tensions between the countries have continued to escalate because Trump pulled out of the deal and, um, and stopped giving aid and then laid on sanctions against the country. And uh, he used a heavy hand. And it just caused the tensions to ratchet up between the two countries. April 8th, 2019, the Trump administration designates Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps a, quote, foreign terrorist organization. And that designation was significant and it was controversial because it was the first time that the U.S. had officially identified a branch of a foreign state as a terrorist organization. April 22, 2019, the U.S. ends waivers for Iran oil sanctions, and so the United States announced that it would no longer grant any waivers to countries to purchase Iranian oil, fully implementing the sanctions that President Trump reimposed in November as part of a maximum pressure campaign against Tehran. So he's putting the pressure on, not just from us, but from other nations. May 5, 2019, air, an aircraft carrier was sent to the Middle East after indications Iran planned attack on U.S. forces. Uh, the United States deployed an aircraft carrier strike group ahead of schedule as well as a bomber task force in the Middle East in response to clear indications that Iran and Iranian proxies were planning an attack on U.S. forces in the region. And a statement from the National Security Advisor John Bolton said that the deployments were intended, quote, to send a clear and unmistakable message to the Iranian regime that any attack on United States interests or on those of our allies will be met with unrelenting force, unquote. Next headline, May 18, 2019, U.S. imposes new sanctions on Iran's metal industries and Iran threatens to break the nuclear deal. And so the new executive order signed by President Trump authorized sanctions on Iranian iron, steel, aluminum, and the copper sectors, which the White House said comprise about 10% of Iran's export economy. Headline, May 10, 2019, Pentagon deploys Patriot anti-missile battery in the Middle East. Headline, May 12, 2019, Iran or Iranian-backed proxies placed explosive charges on four ships. May 24, so Iran's now... Uh, countering. May 24, 2019, headline, more troops headed to the Middle East, so an additional 1,500 U.S. troops and increased defensive capabilities were sent to the Middle East to continue to help deter Iran. So, you know, it's move, counter move, move, counter move, building up tensions. June 2nd, 2019, Iran's Foreign Minister Javed Zarif says U.S. sanctions are economic terrorism, so they're pushing back. June 17, 2019, Iran said that it was a was within 10 days of violating 2015 containment deal, and then U.S. announces deployment of additional troops to the Middle East. June 20, 2019, Iran shoots down a U.S. drone. On June 24, 2019, Trump announces new sanctions on Iran. September 6, 2019, U.S.-Iran diplomatic deal hangs in balance as Tehran breaches new nuclear limit. November 5, 2019, Iran announces government will inject uranium gas into centrifuges. December 13, 2019, Pompeo offers stark warning to Iran. December 27, 2019, rocket attack at military base in Iraq kills U.S. civilian contractor, wounds several uh, service members. December 29, 2019, the U.S. airstrikes hit Iranian-backed group in Iraq. December 31st, 2019, protesters attacked the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad in response to U.S. strikes. January 2nd, 2020, Soleimani is killed at the direction of President Trump. January 7th, 2020, missiles from Iran target U.S. facilities in Iraq. Trump's Mideast peace plan sparks growing Israeli-Palestinian tension. Uh, the Palestinian political factions called on the Palestinians to hold rallies and demonstrations all over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip to protest against the peace plan. So, in other words, while all this stuff's going on between the U.S. and Iran, there's stuff happening in Israel, too, because the peace plan, the, the deal of the century that President Trump is helping to negotiate through his proxies with Netanyahu, 
um, is going to call for the annexation of land that the Palestinians dispute and say that's their land. And in fact, not only do they want to keep that land, they want more land. Trump's deal is, is uh, calling for Israel to annex that land and take them from them. So annexation is considered to be as early as July 1st under the netanyahu Gantz deal. Uh, Gantz opposed annexation in the past, but the, the coalition agreement allows, you know, between, because what had to happen is Gantz couldn't form a government, Netanyahu couldn't form a government, government by himself. So they joined together and they made a deal. And the deal was that Netanyahu would serve as prime minister for the first 18 months and then Gantz would for the second 18 months. But part of the agreement was Netanyahu wanted to move forward with annexation of the land of Palestine, the West Bank. And if he were to form this deal, that was part of the, uh, that was on the negotiating table that he could push forward with annexation, and so he's going to do that. And so as early as July first, he's going to start annexing that land in the Middle East. And of course, the PLO and the PA have rejected rejected Trump's peace plan, and uh, they are threatening all-out retaliation. So that's just ratcheting everything up. So you got all these tensions with with the U.S. and Iran. You've got all these tensions with Syria and now Russia. Then you've got these tensions with Israel and the Palestinians and all of the nations that are backing the Palestinian state. I mean, the whole thing is boiling up and it looks like it could spill over into a war that could be the Th Ezekiel 38 war. So is the Ezekiel 38 war about to start? We can't know for sure. I mean, we can't predict it and say this is exactly going to be it, but it absolutely could be the trigger that starts that particular war. We can certainly see that the stage is being set to fulfill biblical prophecy. And when that war does start, if this is that war, and that war starts, the trigger is pulled, and we are in the countdown for the last days. That's an incredible reality that you and I face. When we say because of the COVID-19 we're going to have a new normal and things are going to go, are not going to go back to the way they were. Things are going to be completely different. Well, if the Gog and Magog invasion happens in our day, that's absolutely true. Things will never go back to the way that they were. That can be frightening, but it can also for the Christian be exciting because it means we are coming close to the day when our Savior splits the eastern sky and we see him face to face. That's something to get excited about. Well, let's continue to watch. Keep our eyes on the eastern sky and keep our eyes on the Middle East and we will keep our eyes in the Word trying to see how we can connect the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament and our day. God bless you.